All right, boys and girls, Ken Smith, Ken Smith Fishing. Part three of the Todd Driscoll interview. So if you don't know Todd Driscoll, Todd is uh, Texas Park and Wildlife Fisheries Biologist. He's over this particular area of East Texas, which happens to include Toledo Bend and Sam Raver. They've got a telemetry study where they're tracking bass in Toledo and in Lake Fork, and they're seeing how the fish react to certain things, specifically to being approached by a boat and an angler fishing for those fish. We've teased you in the first two videos. This video, he starts talking about his findings. And I'm going to tell you, there's two things that I was fascinated by in this video. So they're actually trying to catch these fish, okay? Once they identify that fish, they're trying to catch them. They got the, the antenna to tell them where it is, and then Todd's got the Garmin live scope where he can see the fish. He can make a presentation directly to the fish. They've been successful. They've caught a couple of these fish. So one of the things they wondered was, when you catch a fish and you turn him loose, where does he go? They know where they go. So that's really interesting. And the other thing I thought was really interesting in this particular video, and there's a lot of good stuff in this video, but they're tracking to see how much a fish moves daily in linear feet. And I was surprised how small it is. So here's part two, or excuse me, part three to the Todd Driscoll video. I think we're gonna have six or seven total parts and it just gets more interesting with each one of these from here forward. The first two were teasers. This is the good stuff, check it out. All right guys, so this is uh, Todd Driscoll again. This will be our third video talking about the tele, tele I can't say that word. Telemetry study they're doing on Toledo Bend in the Housen Basin, tracking bass. So the first two parts about, we talked about why you did this study, or, or I say you, you being Texas Park and Wildlife. And then part two, we started talking a little bit about some of your observations, but let's talk a little bit more about, and, and, and also about the mortality, but let's talk a little bit yeah. more about the observations of what you're, you're seeing with these fish. Yeah, we, we, of course, we talked earlier, you know, part of the objectives were actually fishing for these fish to see if, if fishing, lure presence, trolling motor noise, boat presence may affect the behavior of these fish. And uh, uh, I've only caught two of them. I mean, the whole premise really isn't catching the fish. It's simulating the angling conditions. But, I mean, a byproduct of that could be we might catch one. Sure. Uh, we've had, let's see, I don't know that I've recorded, I'm going to guess, we're up to maybe 75 or 80 fishing events. I only caught two of those fish, which is is somewhat interesting. That tends to tell me, you know, there's maybe just a, at any instantaneous point in time, just maybe a small percent of the bass might be willing to bite. Because I, mean, so I know exactly where that fish is. You, and you're throwing at that fish. I'm, wa I'm watching it with live scope. I mean, you know, sometimes it's on a big stump or a big lay down. I can't see the fish, but it's there. Our, our, our error is only about 10 feet with that telemetry antenna. We do our dangest to exactly pinpoint it, and we'll throw a buoy out. Do you think you've seen one of these fish on your live scope? Oh, there's, undoubtedly. I mean, if the fish are suspended or they're two feet away from a big stump, there's unquestionably you can see them. And we'll get into some of that a little bit later, but uh, knowing exactly where a fish is, watching it on scope, or at least Man, we know it's on that big spider stump right there. Every cast hitting it and only catch two out of what I say, 75 ready fishing events. Pretty. We're not very good at catching them. At least I'm not. No, we're I mean, not. Maybe, we're, maybe, maybe you might have better luck. <laughs> no, we but, know uh, that's not the case <laughs> based upon but, this past weekend. But yeah, I mean, I was expecting, you know, maybe 5 or 10% of the time to catch a fish. But no, it's been way lower than that. And what was interesting, of course, in theory, what, what we're going to do, and, and, and it appears to be. Well, you say that, though. That's 75 episodes. You've caught two of them. That's not too far off that number. Well, that's a, I mean, that's, that's still a pretty low Three percentage. Three percentish? Yeah. 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 I'm not very good at math in my head, but that's, that's yeah. you know, yeah, something like that. Yeah. So, uh, but anyway, I, I, I think that's, you know, Pretty interesting in and of itself. And those two fish that I caught, of course on paper, if our sample size is high enough, it's something else we were going to explore is, okay, when we catch a fish and release it, what does it do? You know, who knows? Well, both of those fish, I mean, as quick as they could, swam right back to the exact stump and dock that they were on. So, and, and when we're that close to a fish, Dan, I mean, he's become an expert with, with that antenna. I mean, it's so directional in the water. 
So when you get right on top of a fish, because you're right there, the instant it moves laterally in any direction, you just instantly know it has. So it, it, it's really pretty, pretty tight in terms of air when you're that close to a fish. And one of those fish I caught under a dock. And it was, you know, this fish tends to love docks. About 80% of the time it's on a dock. Size fish? Six pounds. Okay. And uh, some of the docks had been on in, in, in like a 200-yard stretch were pretty large docks to where there was a little bit more air there because I couldn't see it on live scope because of the dock pilings and whatnot. At least I couldn't, didn't think I could see it. So I might have had a 10 or 12-foot target zone. But the day I caught it, it was on a narrow little walkway. Of course, the depth it was in, it's pretty shallow, and I just assumed it was on the end, and sure enough, I think I caught it the first cast. But as soon as we released it, right there underneath that dock, and it just stayed right there. So that really suggests <laughs> something that Dickie Newberry has said to me for years is true, and he, said, he has always said, he believes if you've got a school of fish on something and you catch one and release it, he believes there's a good chance that fish goes back down there and basically says, dudes, don't bite. It spooks that school. And that would suggest if they do go right back to that spot, that's a possibility. Oh, yeah. I mean, I think that's, you know, what, what Dickie was suspecting. I mean, I think that commonly happens out in deep water for sure. I mean, I think some of that's been scientifically proven, at least with bait fish. When they're stressed, they give off, uh, I think it's called, it's a, it's a strange term, uh, Shrekstoff, I think is what it's called. Okay. Don't hold me to that. I'd have to look it up to be sure, but it, 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 it's a, something the fish emit that signals danger. Stressor, yeah. Yes. Whether bass do that, I don't think it's been proven, but certainly yeah. certain species of forage fish have been shown to do just that as a, as a, as a defensive. Which you would also think might attract bass that could be. You got stressed bait could fish be, in there. But sample size is real small right now, sample size of two. The, the other fish was on a uh, big spider stump on a 10, 10 to 15 foot drop, and uh, same deal. As soon as it was released, I mean, of course, we saw what direction it swam, and then stayed there for a few minutes. I mean, went, went, as quick as it could get there, back on that stump it got caught from. I'm curious, rabbit hole here, any thought to trying to catch them with live bait? No, uh, that's, you know, might be a, a, a decent angle to take. You know, the, the, the fishing was, I don't want to say an afterthought to all this. I mean, certainly catching a fish essentially was. We were just wanting to document mm -hmm. traditional bass angler fishing behaviors, yeah. and certainly live bait really isn't part of that. Now, yeah. if a, a really strong objective would have been fish catch, we'd probably maybe have to incorporate that yeah. potentially. Okay. But, but no, that, that's not something that we're going to do in this study. Okay. Let's see. Let's dig into uh, some of the specific data. So we've been tracking these fish three to five months. We're up to uh, 124 total fish locations recorded. And several of these fish we have found every single tracking event, and that's been 11 total times, again, going over there every two weeks. Some of these fish have been really predictable. Uh, what I say, 14 or 15, no, 13 or 14, finding every time. Nearly every time, 11 we have found every time. And part of that is due to... Uh, pretty limited movements. I mean, almost shockingly so. Yeah, it makes somewhat common sense that, you know, a natural predator is only going to move as much as it has to. But I probably would have expected more movement than what we're seeing. Any, any, uh, are those particular group of fish larger or smaller, or is it kind of across the spectrum? It's across the spectrum. Okay, all right. In fact, well, because the, the, our biggest fish, the eight pounder, is showing some a couple unique things. I'll even talk about it some, but specifically, but uh, overall, fish movement is only averaging 130 lateral feet per day. Now, holy smokes! Now, there's a caveat to that, right? We can't be out there yep. every hour or every four hours tracking these fish. You know, we got. A lot of other things going on. We can only devote so much time to this project, so we're only tracking the fish every two weeks. Mm -hmm. So obviously, after 14 days go by, we calculate the distance and feet it moved from the last tracking event and divide it by 14 to calculate per day. What we don't know is what is it doing every day. 
you know, this might point towards more real small home ranges maybe, not necessarily movement. I mean, the movement, you have to understand, it is what it is. You're only tracking these fish once every two weeks. Some of these fish are showing low movement, but maybe have moved two or three miles down the shoreline, which might mean low movement, but big home range. Whereas other fish might stay in the same general half mile area and might be moving constantly in a 24 hour cycle. And maybe just due to luck of the draw, it's kind of back close. You understand what I'm trying mm -hmm. to point out? Mm -hmm. It's just, you have to interpret that movement with a grain of salt because it's every two weeks. But still, pretty low overall movements, yeah. unquestionably. And uh, is, there, is there grass in housing right now? Very little. Okay. Which is actually for this, I mean, I, I'm like most all other anglers, we need the grass back over there for sure. Uh, we wish I, we could snap our finger and get it back instantaneously, but it has given us some unique opportunities to, to do this study that probably wouldn't have been available if we had a lot of grass. A lot of this stuff, looking at the outboard motor noise and, and, and fishing on behavior of these fish, we couldn't have done in dense vegetation. Right. It would have been impossible. Yeah. So lack of grass has given us a little bit of benefit in some of the things that we're looking at. But to that point, I would tend to expect more movement potentially with no grass. I would too. So yeah. I think that's where you may have been going yep. with it. So yep. given the lack of grass and still almost no movement, has been pretty That's surprising. why I asked it, was it those fish living on a grass bed? It's been pretty surprising, and of course that was every observation averaged together. Now if you look at individual fish, the movement has varied from essentially zero. We got some fish that almost, I mean they're all, the size of this room, they're not moving. At least when we're, when we're tracking them every two weeks. I think, uh, I mean, I, intuitively it suggests to me, if you've checked them six, eight, ten times and they're still right there, they're not moving a bunch during the day. That makes perfect sense to me. And that's, you have to make some assumptions too yep, along with yep. studies like this. I mean, I'd love to go out there two nights a week and do right, it and right, see what's right, going right. on. But Some researchers look at what we call dial movements, movements over a 24 hour period to assess that. It's just not something we're digging into. We're more interested in more wide scale sure, movements. Absolutely. Yeah. And to your point, these low distances are documenting not much movement. Yeah. Common sense would tell, you, would tell you that. Now, if you look at the individual fish specifically, again, some aren't moving at all. One, the, the fish moving the most is still only averaging 426 feet a day. Not much. No. Not much. Now, Football field. Now, also keep in mind, I mean, what's going to be interesting are the seasonal effects. And we only have data for May, June, July, August, and September. So as we get into the fall, winter, and the spring, maybe we see some more movement. Maybe not. But we really don't have enough data to really dig into much, much seasonal things right now. So the time will tell on that. Uh, you know, and another thing that that tends to tell me, the low movement, again, a natural predator, outside of the reproductive season, I think most of its behavior is around its food. That's what its whole life is dictated by, is a food supply, pretty much. And what is the primary food supply until it been? Threadfin shad. And I think that gets to the low movement. It speaks to how productive Toledo Bend is in terms of the shad forage base. I mean, the oh, shad there, are there, literally everywhere. There are gizzard shad in Toledo. There are. Okay. Yeah, biomass wise, in terms of what, what the fish eat, it's primarily thread fin. The gizzard shad grow pretty fast. A lot of anglers wouldn't know this because you're going to very rarely catch one, but a gizzard shad commonly get 12 plus inches long. I've seen they just, giant ones. Yeah, they just get too big for bass to eat. So that most of the edible biomass is, is thread fin. How, how big will a thread fin get? You know, a four or five inch is a big one. Okay. So, Which yeah. is still fine for a three pounder. Yeah, so these low movements, at least from May to September, tell me the forage base is so abundant, these fish literally have no dang reason to move. They're not chasing one of those little... And our live scope is proving just that. And, and I'll dig into that here in a minute, but some of our uh, fish... They're just relating to shad, that's all they're doing. So I think the high forage availability, the shad essentially are everywhere. Fish just doesn't have to move much. When it gets hungry, it just starts looking around and within a few hundred feet of it, max, hey, there's shad deep. Just like living on a buffet line. It literally is. If you uh, look at, uh, 
and see what would be the next good thing to jump into. Uh, let's look at uh, some habitat. Uh, well, first off, we're classifying fish whether they're uh, shoreline related or offshore. We're defining shoreline within 30 feet of the bank, uh, sure. the shoreline itself, shoreline and offshore. Uh, see, we have about, uh, yeah, of the 124 total fish locations, uh, 29 of those were shoreline. But in the vast majority, 95 were offshore. Given the lack of, of shoreline cover, I think it plays a big role in that, but a very small percent of these fish are staying, quote unquote, Shop. shoreline related. Yeah. They're, they're at least 30 feet off the bank. Okay. So, Which know, I would totally believe. Be curious to see what happens in October and November. Right. And, and those of us that fish the fleet don't know, it's just, you know, summer. Summer is just not a bank beating tide mm -hmm. lake. No. That's why it's gotten tough this last couple of years. Exactly. Of exactly. Exactly. So, uh, uh, what about uh, timber? You know, I haven't actually calculated this yet. I plan on it, but I would venture a guess, and, and you tell me if I'm close. I think 70% or so of housing bayou has standing timber. Oh, somewhere easy. In there. Yeah, definitely. Well, with that said, Essentially, it was almost an equal split. We had 65 fish that we found were in standing timber, but 59 were in bare bottom areas with no timber. It almost seems like the fish are maybe slightly selecting more so for the bare areas, just given there's only now, 20 to 30 percent. That's why I want to know, are we causing that? Because there's more fishing pressure in the timber. Could be. I mean, and, I, and, some, and some of our data you know, shows some behavioral effects. So uh, about a 50-50 split there with timber in the bare areas, even though the bare areas maybe only account for 20 to 30 percent of housing. Uh, we talk limited amounts of vegetation in housing. Given that, the fish seem to be pretty highly selective for it because 33 of those 124 were in vegetation, even though it's a very small percent of the total acreage in housing. Yeah, it's just a few lily pads and a little it's bit of It's so hydrilla. small that I would tell you like 80 percent of housing there's no vegetation for a fish to get into. And by the way, for those of you who don't know Toledo, 2016, that would have been 80% of housing had vegetation, I would guess. Back in 2015. 15, okay, it, yeah. It crashed during the spring of 16. Yeah, yeah, so with the high water. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, let's see. Okay, offshore structure. Here we're looking at uh, our classifications are points, drops, drains, channel swings, Creeks are just uh, flats. All right, you know, no you know what we're going to make people do? Come Wait back to part episode. four. We're going to make them come back to part four. We're trying to keep these about 15 minutes a pop. So let's stop right there. We'll be right back to part four. I'm going to post these real quick so guys don't, so we don't really leave them dangling. I want to come back to that exact thought. Thanks, guys. We'll be back in the next couple days with the next episode of this. All right, so there you go. Uh, I'll post this video between, so you just saw a Lexus video, Lexus, a Vexus video for me. Uh, this video will come up and then we'll get part one, assuming we don't get weathered out of the Blazer Boat Review video and maybe even part two before we get the next part of the Todd Driscoll series up. So hope you guys are enjoying this. Thanks for all the shares. Thanks for all the comments. Guys, as I've told y'all, comments in the YouTube world is money, right? It says, man, I like this guy's stuff. So comments and thumbs up are great. And you know, I don't get a lot of thumbs up, so I really do appreciate when I do. I, I know you guys just don't think about doing it, but it means something. It's the currency of YouTube. So I appreciate it every time I get a comment or a thumbs up. And uh, if guys, if you have reached out to me and I have not responded to you, let me just share this with you. Guys, reach out to me on Facebook, on Fishing Forum, on Bass Boat Central, through my email. Uh, a lot of guys have my phone number. And uh, if I haven't responded to you, I've lost it. Please reach out again. The best place to reach out to me is through my email, kensmithfishingatoutlook.com. Um, but I, I, sometimes I get behind. I get 15, 20, 30 messages a day, and every once in a while they slip through the cracks. So if I ignored you, I promise you I didn't mean to ignore you. Reach out again. I almost get every one of the emails back. The other ones are the ones that are a little bit harder to track. But please reach out. And by the way, you know, I hadn't mentioned this. I quit my job this morning. I sat at the same desk for 22 years. 
and some things happened with that particular employer that I couldn't stomach anymore. So I've left that job. So if you've been reaching out to me on my old phone number, which was the 214 phone number, that phone number is now dead. Uh, I've got a new phone number. All you are my friends. Uh, I'll get it to you as quick as I can. But if you need to visit with me, email me at kensmithatoutlook.com and I'll get my new phone number. I'm not going to put it out on YouTube because there are just too many people out there that I don't know. But uh, I, I've got the 972 phone number, prefix 972. Uh, and if you need to visit with me, I'm glad to call you back. And so you'll have that number going forward. So there you go. And to that point, guys, I'm starting over. 31 years in the insurance business. If you need some life insurance, man, this will be a wonderful time to get a phone call because I could use the business right now. I am literally starting over at 58 years old with that much income. So I'm not begging, I'm asking, but uh, I would love to hear from you if you think you need some life insurance or if you want me to look over your existing life insurance. That's something I do every day for my clients. I'd appreciate it. So thanks for tuning in. Sorry about the little insurance commercial right there on the end, but Daddy's a little scared right now. <laughs>